Hello, everyone. I want to talk to you today about a special topic. If I had to phrase it as a question, it would be something like, how did Paul create his gospel? That's what he calls it. He refers to my gospel. He says he got it from Jesus Christ directly. And I want to take a look at that and unpack it a little bit. You know, after working on Paul for 30 years, I published this book, Paul and Jesus. It's a popular trade book, easy to read. In some ways, I hope it's a page turner if you're interested in the subject. And there is a chapter in this book called Reading the New Testament Backwards, which is so important to understand. When people start reading the New Testament, they start obviously with the Gospels that many people see as kind of biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you get to the book of Acts, the story of the church, and then finally the letters of Paul and all the rest. But what really is happening chronologically is that Paul comes first. In other words, in terms of the literature of the New Testament, the letters of Paul are the earliest thing that we have. And then what we begin to see, and I'll show you a little bit of that today, is that Paul's idea of the gospel actually then permeates into Mark, and then Matthew follows Mark, and Luke and Acts follow Mark, and then John also, as the fourth gospel, is also deeply influenced by Paul. The author of John has some of his own ideas as well. But the entire New Testament, with some exceptions I'll discuss in this video, is basically Pauline. That's the adjective we use. So let me start with this, how Paul created his gospel, and I put it in double quotes because that's how he talks about it. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, we call it, you get this defense Paul makes of his gospel, and he defines it. Now, it's usually been understood as Paul got it from the apostles, from Peter, James, and John, and the others, and then he, a latecomer, began to preach what they were preaching. I'd like to suggest that the reverse is actually the case, and I think we can demonstrate it. I'm convinced that Paul created his gospel. Now, whether he got it through Jesus or from Jesus, you know, that's a matter of personal belief. But I'm talking more in terms of a history of religions. If we look at these texts, I think I can show you where he got what he calls his gospel. So we can start right here in verse 1. Now, I would remind you, brethren, he writes to the Corinthians, in what terms I preach to you the gospel. He just calls it here the gospel, like one gospel, which you received. Now, I put the Greek word in, paralambano. You don't have to know Greek, but just notice that word. It means to pass something along. In other words, I have this gospel, this message, this good news, and I passed it on to you, paralambano, in which you stand, by which you're saved, if you hold fast, unless you believed in vain. So he reminds them, look, I passed on to you what I received. For I delivered, and that's a different Greek word, similar, paradidomai, to give or pass on officially. So this is to get it, and this is to pass it on officially in a very official apostolic way. For I delivered to you as a first importance, which also I received. Notice, they received it, and now he says he received it. Now, it's very common among scholars as well as general readers to interpret this as he received it from the apostles who went before him. In other words, he went up to James and Peter and John in Jerusalem, because he does say he visited them, and that's where he got his gospel. Therefore, when we read his exposition of it, in other words, that when he received what might be called the thatness of the gospel, the contents, that, 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 and that. You've got four that's, okay? What are the four that's? That, the Messiah, Christ, died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, notice, and that he was buried, and that he was raised the third day in accordance with the scriptures, okay? And that 
he appeared or literally was seen by. It's the verb to see, and it's in the aorist passive. He was seen by, he was sighted by Cephas, Peter, then the 12. So here you get your that's and now your thens. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at once, most of whom are still alive. When Paul writes this, this was in the 50 CE or AD, though some have died, fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, the leader of the apostles, actually, He's head of the 12. You got the 12, and then James is the leader. Many of you know that or realize that. Uh, and then to all the apostles, there are more than just the 12. And last of all, because Paul comes later, a kind of 13th apostle, he appeared also to me. And it's the same word, was seen by, was seen by, was seen by. He was seen by me. So I'd like to suggest to you that the gospel which he passed on that they received and that he delivered was something he received and that he got it from the scriptures and he believes that it was delivered to him by inspiration of Jesus Christ, not from the apostles that went before him. Now, let me give you my reasons for suggesting that. Now, the most common interpretation of these verses right here from three on through eight is that Paul is passing on what he received from the Jerusalem church, so to speak, from the Jewish followers of Jesus in Jerusalem, led by James, Peter, as he calls him, Cephas here, John. These are the pillars of the church that Paul even names in the book of Galatians. I think that's incorrect, and I'll give you my arguments. In Galatians 1 verse 11, he is writing to some of his followers in the province of Galatia in Asia Minor. And he says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, basically, it's a generic word, that the gospel which was preached by me is not a human gospel. And if you just had that, you could say, well, no, because God inspired the 12 and James to also have this gospel. But that's not what he says. For I did not receive, there it is again, Paralambano, I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it. And this is what many people say, is that Paul was taught by the apostles that went before him and by James and the others. And the idea is that there's just this one message. It goes all the way back to the original witnesses. And now we've got Paul's testimony to that. I don't think we have that at all. I think we have Paul's testimony to what he received through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, he does say it's according to the scriptures. So what he received was an understanding of scriptures that he equates with Jesus himself. But it's more than that, as we're going to see. Because here he says, For I receive, same word again, paralambano, from the Lord what I also delivered to you. So he's, he doesn't say he got it from the apostles that went before him. And what is he talking about? He's talking about the Last Supper, taking bread and saying, this is my body, taking a cup and saying, this is my blood, drink it. He says he got this from the Lord. Now, we're all familiar with that from the Gospels, particularly the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, because Mark records the Last Supper. Matthew gets it from Mark. Luke gets it from Mark. John doesn't actually have that idea, but he has a different idea about eat my flesh, drink my blood in his gospel, but it's very similar. It's just not a scene of a Last Supper. But look what Paul says. I received it from the Lord. Here he says, it came from the Lord, a revelation of Jesus Christ. The Lord is Jesus, as he uses it here, kurios. So if he's getting this kind of material from the Lord, an actual event that took place, it's more than just him reading scriptures and coming up with his interpretations that he attributes to Jesus Christ, but it's also he's hearing voices, he's hearing words. I wrote my dissertation, it's now published, this was many years ago, 40 years ago or so when I was working on this at the University of Chicago, uh, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, and the entire book is a study of Paul and his mystical 
message and his gospel as he received it. And I lay it all out there in great detail. And I focus on the passage in 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul says he was taken up to heaven, entered paradise to the highest heaven, and saw things that are unutterable, mysterious things that know that it's not even lawful to reveal. And then he talks about receiving vocal messages from Jesus, conversational messages. And that's the idea that you get here. So one of the things that you begin to see in early Christianity, because you've got a kind of Judeo-Christian group, let's call it the Jerusalem branch of the movement and the Pauline branch. And later, this is into the second and third century, the Jerusalem branch continues intact after 70, even though the city of Jerusalem is destroyed. These followers of Jesus and even relatives of Jesus, they were called the Despasunai, but the Jewish believers in Jesus who continue to hold on to what they believe was the original faith, we get controversies, sharp controversies between them through the mouth of Peter and Paul as a Simon Magus figure. And one of the things that's asked in these second and third century writings, they're called the pseudo-Clementine correspondence, is the question, why should we trust Paul, who's receiving visionary experiences and revelations, over the apostles and James, who are actually with Jesus in the flesh? And Paul says things like in 2 Corinthians, we no longer know Jesus after the flesh, even though we once might have known him that way. Now we know the heavenly Christ. So Paul claims to be following Christ, but he never knew Jesus face to face as far as we knew. He might have seen him from a distance or heard about him because he was in Jerusalem, we think, when Jesus was crucified. And he kind of cheered things on, according to what he says. He was against the movement. Okay? So where did Paul get his ideas? You know, he, he got revelations, he got visions, he talks about that, and he heard voices. But he also says, my gospel is according to the scriptures. And what we have here from the book of Isaiah, it's called the Suffering Servant Song, 5213 all the way down to 5312 are the elements of Paul's gospel. This is clearly where he got it. Notice, he calls Jesus the servant. My servant will prosper. He will be exalted and lifted up and be very high. But before that, he's brought down very, very low. That's the contrast. You also see that in the Gospel of Mark. You see it in Paul constantly. We will be exalted and glorified and lifted up. He even says, seated at the right hand of God with a glorious body like Jesus Christ. Read Romans 8, Philippians 3, and so forth. First comes the suffering, then comes the glorification. And then he was marred. This is the servant. He thinks is Jesus. Beyond any human semblance, you couldn't even recognize him because of his suffering. But when he's exalted, he will startle the nations, not just the Jewish people or the Israelites. Kings will shut their mouths because of him. They'll be like, how could this happen? For that which has not been told them, they will see. And what Paul believed is that Jesus is going to appear in the clouds of heaven. He's going to raise the dead in Christ. He's going to raise the living up. They're going to receive glorified bodies. He talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15. He takes it very literally. It's not an allegory. And those who pierced him are going to mourn because they're going to see him coming in great glory. Okay? Now, Paul quotes this, so we know he's working in this chapter. In Romans 10, 16, he's talking about his gospel and preaching it. And he says, who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Well, he's going to say, to us. We're the ones who know this. The Jewish people as a whole or the Israelite people, he says, have been blinded. They don't really see this. So who's believed? Now notice, this person, this figure, this servant was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. 
People hid their faces from him. He was despised. We esteemed him not. Paul picks up on that language all the time in his letters about his own suffering. He says that this servant was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement, his wounds, his suffering, and his blood. All we like sheep have gone astray. Remember, Paul says, none is righteous, no, not one. Goes over that repeatedly in the book of Romans, chapter 3. We've turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of his soul. So he's convinced that this is Jesus of Nazareth. And all of us have had our sins placed upon Jesus. Now, for most people, it would be like, Tabor, why are you even doing this? What else is new? It's called Christianity. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You've got to believe in him. If you believe, you'll have eternal life and so forth. Well, what if that is the message of Paul? But do we know that that's the message of the early followers of Jesus in the time of Jesus? Or did it come from Paul? Paul said that he got it by revelation and was not taught it by men. And he says it's according to these scriptures. Okay, let's go on. Because I think you're going to see the whole pattern here. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Taken away, meaning what? Does that mean he was killed? Let's keep reading. As for his generation, who considered that he was cut out of the land of the living? I think that means you're dead. Stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and a rich man in his death. Now, let me go back here. Look at this. If I go back to what we started with, Christ died for our sins. We just read that in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried, okay, and he was raised on the third day. So that's the pattern. Those are the that's, right? Notice, this is death. This is burial. A grave is burial. They made his grave. People discuss today, did Paul believe in an empty tomb? Did he believe Jesus was buried? Some have suggested that Jesus was just left on the cross to rot or that he was buried in a trench grave or something like that. Here you have a grave with the wicked and a rich man associated with his death. And we know the story of Joseph of Arimathea in terms of all of our accounts of the burial of Jesus, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit. So Jesus doesn't resist when he's arrested and so forth. And he makes himself an offering for sin. This implies resurrection, as does this. Being lifted up and made very high after you've been brought down very low and even cut off from the land of the living, it doesn't get lower than that. You're basically dead and buried. And then he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. To prolong his days doesn't mean he doesn't die. What's implied here, and certainly it's how Paul takes it, is he will be raised up and receive eternal life. He will prosper. From the travail of his soul, he will see light. Now, that's not the normal translation in English Bibles. In, in the traditional Hebrew text, it doesn't say what he's going to see. But in the Dead Sea Scroll copy of Isaiah, which is the oldest copy we have, it says from the travail of his soul, from this suffering, he's going to be in Sheol, in the grave, and he will see light. Whenever you see light, you can look in other passages in Isaiah where light falls upon the darkness of the world of the dead, and they wake up. So now he's called the righteous one, my servant, will make many righteous and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I'll divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. This is where Philippians 2 comes from, that Jesus takes on the form of a servant, suffers and dies on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. It's not talking about pre-existence, incarnation. If you read Philippians 2, 5 through 10, it's an exegesis of this passage. It's very, very clear. So this is where Paul got his gospel, inspired, he would say, by Jesus, and received other things that he claimed were from Jesus, such as what happened at the Last Supper 
on the night Jesus was betrayed, as he calls it. Now, let's talk about Isaiah's four servant songs, they're called by scholars, and we can identify them. In the book of Isaiah, from chapter 40 through 53, and we just read the end of 53 about the suffering servant, 20 different times you've got a reference to Israel as the servant, my servant Israel, you are my servant Israel, and so forth. The first one is 41, 8 through 9. But within those chapters, Isaiah 40 through 53, in these 20 times, you get four sections that stand out as different. And they do use the word servant, but it's not clear that it's the nation. It seems to be a select individual. It doesn't say a Messiah, but a chosen one, a faithful one, who's not blind or deaf, because Israel as a nation is said to be blind and deaf. But then there's this other individual, it sounds like, addressed as a servant. 42, 1 through 4, 49, 1 through 6, 54 through 11, and then the one that we read, the long extended one, okay? So out of these four servant songs, as they're called, gets built by Paul, what he calls his gospel. Now, I want to follow up on that, but let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. Another verse. For our sake, he says to the Corinthians, he, God, made him to be sin who knew no sin. So remember what we saw in 52 through 53, particularly in 53, uh, he's innocent. He's like a lamb led to the slaughter. He has no violence or deceit. So he knows no sin, but he is made to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So this substitutionary atonement idea, as people later call it, which is the heart and soul of Christianity, I'm convinced, started with Paul. And as Paul came up with this, created this, however you want to explain it, People would say, well, Jesus revealed it to him. But most interpreters have said, no, that goes all the way back to Jesus himself. I'm suggesting to you that it starts with Paul, and that Paul is the one who really creates this idea and develops it according to the scriptures, as he says, and that he received it and passed it on, but he received it from the Lord through the scriptures and also through direct revelation. So what do we find? In the Gospel of Mark, Mark creates the Gospel narrative based on Paul. I'm offering an online course on Mark. You can start at any time. It's called Creating Jesus. I'll put the link up where you could take a look at it if you're interested in it. And I go through and I try to show how Mark creates a Jesus based on Paul. You've already seen the Lord's Supper, taking the bread, taking the cup, Paul said he got that from Jesus. He didn't say he got it from James and Peter and John talking with them. He says, I received that from the Lord, 1 Corinthians 11. The Lord is Jesus. Now, notice the very first verse of Mark, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is obviously the good news about Jesus, but it's also the good news from Jesus, based upon Paul. And in the middle of Mark, and I cover this in this online course very thoroughly, chapters 8, 9, and 10, three chapters, three times the suffering servant theme is revealed, and it comes right from these songs, I'm telling you, even the language. It's revealed for the first time to the apostles. They don't understand it. And what's said is that he will suffer many things, Jesus. He'll be rejected, mocked spit upon, scourged, killed, and rise the third day. The third day comes from Hosea 6. It's about the healing of the people of Israel, which is this right here, the servant Israel. But then it's also about a resurrection or a healing of the suffering servant as well, who will rise the third day. You can look it up. 
And the climax is Mark 10, 45. This is the climax of this section of Mark. It's also the climax of the entire book of Mark. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, suffering servant, and give his life as a ransom for many. And if you go back to Isaiah 53, he will make many righteous. That word many is actually a clue that Mark is working right out of Isaiah 53. And then, of course, the Lord's Supper on the night he was betrayed. I've already mentioned Mark 14. So Mark creates a Pauline gospel. Matthew incorporates that. It, of course, Matthew has changes and adaptations and additions and subtractions and editing and so forth. Luke comes along and he uses 70% of Mark because he has a lot of extra material and so forth. But essentially, it's, it's the same story. And even John is basically presenting Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That phrase is a direct development of what Paul began to preach and teach as his gospel. Okay? Now, what is Paul's legacy then? This is what I'm convinced of. If you... Uh, want to read the book, you'll get the full version of why I think this. I believe Paul created what people popularly know as Christianity. His legacy was not so much in his own lifetime, but it was mainly through these 13 letters that are in his name. And then Mark, following Paul, creating the story. So you basically get the theology, as we call it, from Paul's letters, as he argues it out and pounds out his different points and applying it to Jews as well as Gentiles. And that's also from Isaiah 52, because there you read that the nations will be startled when this one is exalted. So you've got the synoptics and Acts, all basically expansions of Mark. You've got John, which is still reflecting Paul, the book of Hebrews all the way. Some people have even argued that Paul wrote it, which I don't think he did, but it is a monument to Pauline theology. Now here, it's very surprising. You say, well, Peter, then he would preserve that original. But if you read 1 Peter, I'm telling you, and many scholars are aware of this, it is such a Pauline production in the name of Peter. Same with 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Jude, not quite so much, but a bit. And Jude, of course, is the brother of Jesus. And then you got the Greek New Testament book of Revelation. I say the Greek because there's a pre-Christian version of Revelation that doesn't have the Pauline message. Then the apostolic fathers and the early church fathers. It's a complete package down to Eusebius and Augustine then, and it gets crowned, signed, sealed, delivered, packaged with a big ribbon. That's Christianity. It's Paul's legacy. I think it's mainly from his letters, not his personal influence in his own time, but it's what really triumphed, and Marcion was a big part of that. So that's another subject. So what survives? What survives? Well, we can still go through the Gospels and find earlier material that is not influenced by Paul. For example, what's sometimes called the Q source that's embedded in Matthew and Luke. It's completely different. It doesn't glorify Paul's ideas at all. It's very, very different, but it's put into a Markan framework, and therefore, for all practical purposes, when people read it, it just becomes Pauline. Everything's Pauline. As far as documents go, beyond something like the Q source or trying to get little pieces of the original message of the Jerusalem church. This is it, the letter of James. If you've never read the letter of James, get a New Testament and read it. Now, this is amazing. You read James, and Jesus is mentioned twice. In the very first verse, he's called the Christ, the Messiah. And in chapter 2, the believers in the synagogue, not the church, are told, hold the faith of Jesus, his faith. And then it goes on to talk about honoring the poor and not going for the rich and so forth. 
what we call the Q material, the kind of Q material. Uh, Sermon on the Mount is one way of referring to it. You read the letter of James, it sounds like the ethical teachings of Jesus embedded in Luke and Matthew in that double source. And I think this is our only reliable remnant of what the movement was like before 70 in Jerusalem, led by James, Peter, and John. I don't think any of this material is giving us much of a clear view of what the original movement was all about. It, is, it truly is Paul's gospel. And a pre-Christian book of Revelation, if you go to my blog, I'll put the link in the description, you can read what I've reconstructed as a pre-Christian version of the book of Revelation. And again, you'll see it's very apocalyptic. It's very much about the kingdom of God arriving and the overthrowing of the kingdom of God based upon Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 and 11 and 12 and so forth. The whole prophetic kind of predictions that are supposed to come. But what you don't find in this pre-Christian version is the whole Jesus message as it's developed by Paul. I know that's something pretty different for people to take hold of, but I think it really stands up. And I think just taking the things that I pointed out as clues, you can do some of your own thinking and follow up. And in the future, I'm going to offer a course on Paul. You know, I've done Mark, I've done the Dead Sea Scrolls, Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'll put the links in the description for all of those. My next course, which I hope will be out later in the summer of 2024 when I'm making this video, it's going to be on the letters of Paul. And we're, to, and we're going to dive in deep, deep, deep and lay all of this out and see what we can make of what we call Christian origins. In other words, how did a new religion called Christianity actually emerge? Lots of scholars would agree that much of it goes back to Paul. But I'm essentially arguing that almost all of it goes back to Paul. I think the early followers of Jesus thought he was the Messiah. They thought he was exalted to heaven. But as Paul says, Jesus was a suffering servant who was then highly exalted and sits at the right hand of God and opens the way for followers to take up that same path, the same ethical path, the same opposition to evil and the forces of evil in the world. And as Albert Schweitzer said, probably getting crushed in the process. Take care, everyone.